people who have to follow Patricia were unbelievers. And now I'm doing it. Terrible thing. Um, it's become fashionable among novelists to say that the most important thing in a novel is the characters. That if you don't understand the characters, like the characters, identify with the characters, if they don't feel real to you, uh, that you're going to stop reading. And I usually tell them I think they're wrong. That what matters is everything. The characters, the setting, the plot, the structure, the quality of the writing, that all of it working together is what makes a book work. And if any one part of it doesn't work, it's going to fall apart. But characters matter. Uh, and I like characters who are quirky, uh, who are memorable, Characters who, when you first meet them in the book, and then five chapters later, you see them again, you remember who they are. You know what I mean? You know, often you read a book and suddenly there's a character, you go, who was that again? You know, I think characters should be memorable. So here's an example of me trying to create a memorable character. My main character, my investigative reporter, who's, who's my main my character, is... Um, has decided that he needs to go see his bookie. So here we are. Dominic Zerilli had lived for 74 years. And every morning for the last 42 of them, he would get up at 6 a.m., put on a blue suit, a white dress shirt, and a silk necktie, and walk four, block, four blocks to his little corner market on Doyle Avenue in Mount Hope. Once inside, he would wish a cheery good morning to the skanky high school dropout manning the register. Then he would climb four steps to the little elevated room with a window that looked out over the grocery piles. He would remove his suit jacket, put it on a wooden hanger, and hang it on a clothes rod he had rigged in the back. Then he would do the same thing with his pants. He would sit there all day in his shirt and tie, his boxer shorts chain-smoking, unfiltered luckies and taking sports and numbers bets through the window over the three telephones that were checked for bugs every week. He would write the bets down on slips of flash paper and deposit them in a great metal wash tub next to his chair. Whenever the cops came to bust him, which only happened when the Rhode Island Lottery Commission got worked up about lost revenue, he would remove the cigarette from his lips and toss it into the wash tub. Whoosh! The officially sanctioned gangsters at the Lottery Commission who pushed work with scratch tickets and chump numbers games resented Zerilli because he gave the suckers a legitimate chance to win. The Mafia always gets better odds than the state. Just about everybody in Mount Hope dropped by Zerilli's store from time to time, either to lay down a bet or to replenish a dwindling supply of malt liquor, soft porn magazines, and illegal tax stamp free cigarettes. They called him Woosh, and it was said that he knew them all by name. I bought my first pack of Topps baseball cards from Woosh when I was seven years old, and he started taking my bets on the Sox and Patriots when I turned 16. Now, thanks to the snow-induced parking ban, I found a spot for Secretariat right up front. A Mulligan drives a, a Ford Bronco, a beat-up Ford Bronco that he calls Secretariat. Pitches, Zerilli said. You want me to look at fucking pictures? That's right. Ah, shit. I thought you was going to ask me about the DiMaggio's. We were sitting in Zerilli's inner sanctum, only one of us wearing pants. The photographs fanned out on his keyhole desk. We'd already gone through our ritual, and presented me with a new box of illegal Cubans and asking me to swear on my mother that I wouldn't write anything about what I saw in there. Me swearing, opening the box, getting a cigar going, and not mention there was nothing to write about because everybody already knew what it went on in there, except for the part about the pants. I said, what's the DiMaggio's? And he said, watch where you flick them fucking ashes. A new way to bet baseball or something? Nah, ain't no way to bet nothing. It's all been done. So? So last week I started thinking. Do I sit around waiting for some asshole to touch my store? Or do I do something about it? Cops been telling me not to worry. Said they put on an extra patrol. Big fucking deal. Like that's gonna do any good. 
Last Thursday night, I got two dozen of the guys together. The guys would come in the store regular, live in the neighborhood. You ain't heard about this? You must be slipping. I figured you would have heard about this. I broke them up into two-man teams, give each of them four or more shifts, overlapping, you know, so there's always four guys on the streets. Some of the guys ain't working, so we cover the whole day, no problem. They're all good guys, mostly mix and wops, a couple of specs. The DiMaggio's, I said. Yeah, well, they needed something to carry, you know, in case they run into trouble. Don't need no more fucking guns on the street. Got enough heavy pukes coming in here with Uzis they buy in schoolyards, scaring the hell half to death. So I got the guys 24 new, brand new Louisville Sluggers. Would have sent me back a few hundred bucks of carmine grass if I hadn't had them sitting around. You know, from the time he uh, acquired a truckload of sporting goods, charged me two bucks a piece. Ended up buying 80 of them. Gonna stick the rest out front of the store this spring. Sell them to the kids. If spring ever comes, this fucking snow. Jesus! And since they're carrying bats, I said, why not name them after the best Watt baseball player who ever lived? Fucking A. The two spicks are calling themselves the A Rods just to piss me off. But they're okay, those guys. Good they got some pride. When we finally got to the pictures, Zarelli's reputation for knowing everyone in the neighborhood turned out to be a might exaggerated. Of the nine faces, he put names to six. Let me keep these a while. Show them to the DiMaggio's, he said. Maybe get some more names to go with the faces. Fine, I said. We got a meeting here tonight, at 9 tonight, before the night shift hits the streets. Probably do it then. Maybe I'll drop by, I said. Bring a photographer, do a little story about the DiMaggio's if it's okay. Get some pictures of the guys holding the bats, he said. Let's get a piss out of the asshole setting the fires. Maybe convince him to pick on some other neighborhood. I'd been neglecting my cigar, and it had gone out. As I fished in my pocket for my Zippo, Zarelli handed me his Calibri, the trifecta model with three compact flames designed to fit perfectly in your palm. Keep it, he said. I can't do that, Bush. You know what these things cost? Grasso gets it for me cheap, as many as I can move, Zarelli said. As long as I keep my mouth shut about where they come from. Besides, you take the Cubans, you know, and you know damn well what they cost. I see your point, I said. I stuck the lighter in my shirt pocket and got up to go. Hey, just a fucking minute, he said. Did you say best WAP baseball player? Is that what you fucking said? Fuck you. Best baseball player that ever lived, period, you fucking heart. That's a relic. You know what, somebody right now, it's like I was coming in, so I come on the stairs, I came in, and then Bruce came in, and this person that I know who I won't name right now, because I don't want to embarrass him. He's white. I was like, oh, okay then. Okay then. Is he? Yeah, he has a hard time remembering something. Uh, okay, so I teach at the College of Staten Island. And... Uh, CUNY! Uh, I have a hard time getting my students to write, so I have to turn it into like a math problem, and then they'll write to me. So, what is your, what was your most difficult age? 45. Anybody else? 16? 15? 12? 12? 12? No, no, 12. to me, because 12, wait a minute, okay, 12, wait a minute, okay, 10th grade, 5th grade, 11th grade, 6th grade, yeah, 12 is rough, okay, for me it was 13, and for most of my students it was 13, so I gave them a project, I said, you don't have to do anything else in this class, this is why you want to be in my class, okay, if you have to do anything else in this class, what I want you to do, your final project will be, I want you to write a poem about being 13. 13 stanzas, 13 lines each stanza, 13 syllables each line. 
That's all they had to do for their fine. Yeah, they were like, oh. That was a lot of work for my students. So that's a lot of work for my students. So of course, when I give them something like that, I say, oh, they have to do it too. So this is 13 ways of looking at 13. This is my 13, by the way. I'm like older than most of you. So a couple of these things you'd be like, uh, what did you just say? 13, this is my 13. As evidenced by the first stanza, you'll be like, I never did that. But I know those of you who have done this will say something. I've mean, been looking over there. Okay. One, you touch your forefinger to the fat clots in the blood, then lift its iron steps to look close, searching the globs of black scarlet for the dimming swirl of dead children. You thread one thick pad's cottony tail, then the other through the little steel guides of the belt. You stand and lift the contraption, press your thighs close to adjust the bulk, then bend to pull up coarse white cotton panties, bleach blue. And, just to be safe, you pin the bottom of the pad to the shredding crotch of the carvers. <laughs> then you spritz the guilty air with the cloying kiss of FDS. It's time to begin the game of justifying ache. Time to name the mystery prickling right in your skin. You convince the boys can smell you. And they came. Two. Right now, this Tuesday in July, nothing's headier than the words sheen, manageable, bounce. Squinting into the smeared mirror, you search your nappiest head for them. You probe with greased fingers, spreading paths in the chaos, wide enough for the advertised glimmer to escape, but your snarls hold tight to their woven dry confounding. Fevered strands snap under the drag of the wiry brush and order unfurls while down the hall Mama rotates the hot comb in a bleary blaze and snacks her joyful gum. Still, TV bellows its promise. You witness the pink snap of the perfect neck, hear the impossible vow, shampoo with this, sheen, bounce. Her corn silk head is gospel, it's so true. Come on, child. Even mama's calling you, Burns. Three. Miss Stein scribbled a word on the blackboard and said, who can pronounce this? And the word was anemone. And from that moment, you first felt the clutter of possible in your mouth. From the time you stumbled through the rhythm and she slow smiled, you suddenly knew you had the right to be explosive, to sling syllables through back doors, to make up your own damn words if you needed them. All that day, sweet anemone tangled in your teeth, spurted sugar tongue, led you to the dictionary where you were assured that it still existed, to the cave of the bathroom where you warbled it in bounce echo, and finally, convinced that you own that teeny gospel, you wrote it again and again and again and a four. Trying hard to turn hips to slivers, sway to stutter, you walk past the Sinclair station where lanky boys, dust in their hair, dressed in their uniforms of oil and thud, rename you pussy with their eyes. Five. You try to keep your hands off your face, but the white cap pimples just might harbor evil. It looks like something cursed is trying to escape your cheeks. Your whole soul could be involved. So you pinch, squeeze, and pop. Let the smelly snow splash the mirror. Slather your fresh scarred landscape with creams that clog and strangle. At night, you look just like someone obsessed with the moon and its gruff superstitions, its lies. Your skin is a patchwork of wishing. You scrub and dab and mask and surround. You bombard, spritz and peel, rubbing alcohol, flesh tongue clarisil that pinkens and cakes while new dirt worms shimmy beneath the pummeled surface of you. Every time you touch your face, you leave a scar. Hey you, every time you touch your face, you leave a scar. Six. You want it all. Pickles with peppermint sticks shoved down their middles. Orange cheese popcorn mixed with barbecue chips. Wax lips and werewolf fangs injected with bright blue juice. 
Red licorice spaghetti whips, pickled pigs feet and ears, hogs had cheese, lemon heads, grits with sugar, salt pork, sardines on saltines doused with red spark. All that Dixie dirt binds, punches your insides flat, reteaches the blind beat of your days. Like mama and her mother before her, you pulse on what is thrown away. Gray hog guts stewed, improbable and limp, scrawny chicken necks merely whispering meat. You will live beyond the naysayers, your rebellious heart constructed of lard and salt, your life labored but long. You are built of what should kill you. Seven. Always treat white folks right, your mama's solemn mantra again and yet again, because they give you things like credit, compliments, <laughs> passing grades, government jobs, direction, extra s &H stamps, produce, I know people like s and stamps, produce, <laughs> produce, produce painted to look fresh, or religion. When the insurance man came, he, she snapped herself alive, hurriedly rearranged her warm bulk. He was balding badly, thatches of red on a scab globe. Just signed here, he hissed, staring crave into your mother's huge breast, pocketing the death cash, money she would pay and pay and never see again. Come here, girl, say hello to Mr. Fred. She had taught you to bow. She had taught him to ignore the gesture, to lock his watering eyes to yours and lick his dry lips with a thick, Coated tongue. Eight. In the bathroom of the whatnot joint on the way to school, you get rid of the starch and billowed lace, barrettes taming unraveling braids, white knee socks and sensible hues. From a plastic bag, you take out electric blue eyeshadow, platforms with silver glittered heels, neon fishnets, and a blouse that doesn't so much button as suggest shut. The transformation takes five minutes, and you emerge feeling like a budding lady, but looking, in retrospect, like a blind streetwalker bursting from a cocoon. <laughs> this is what television does. Turns your mother into clueless backdrop, fills your pressed head with the probability of throne. Your body becomes just not yours anymore. It's a dumb little marquee. Nine. With your bedroom door closed, you are a skyscraper bouffant, peach foundation, eyelashes like upturned claws. You are exuding ice, pitched all over by earrings. You are much too much woman for this room. The audience has one chest, a single shared chance to gasp. They shudder, heave, waiting for you to open your mouth and break their hearts. Taking the stage, you become an S, pour ink in the hip swings, tsk, tsk, as the front row collapses. Damn, they want you. You lift the microphone. Something illegal comes out of you. A sound like titties and oil. Mama flings the door open with a church version of your name. Then you are pimpled, sexless, ash and double dutch knees. You are spindles. You are singing into a hairbrush. Ten. This is what everyone else is doing. Skating in soul circles, skinning shins, tuck kissing in the courtroom, skimming alleys for Chicago rats, failing English, math, crushing curfew, lying about yesterday and age, slipping Woolworth's bounty into an inside pocket, sprouting breast. Here is what everyone else is doing. Sampling the hotness of hooch, grinding under blue light, getting turned around in the subway, flinging all those curse words, inhaling a quick supper before supper, fried up in hot Crisco and granulated sugar, sneaking out through open windows when the night goes dark, calling mama's bitch under their breath, staying up till dawn to see what hides. Here's what you are doing. Reading. Eleven. You are never too old, 
And you are never too world, too almost grown. You are never correct, no matter how many times you are corrected. It is never too late, never too early to be told to cross the street to where the wild stuff grows. To suffer your mama's instructions. Uh-uh, honey, not that little switch. Get the big one. The one that makes that good whooping sound when the breeze blows. And you are never too fast crossing the boulevard to bring it back while wind sedans carve jazz upon your path. You climb the stairs, she screams, get on up here. The door to where you live with her flies open. She snatches the thorn branch, whips it a hundred times across the backs of your legs. You want her to die? No, not once, many times. <laughs> Gently. Twelve. That boy does not see you. He sees through you past your tone of undecided earth. You are the exact shade of the, pay, the failed paper bag test, the Aunt Esther. You are a hair forever turning back in the direction from which it came. You are clacking knees and nails bitten to blood. Stumbling forth in black Jesus prescribed shoes, you have no knowledge of his knowledge of hip sling and thrust. That boy don't see you. So squeeze your eyes shut and imagine your mouth touching the swell of his forearm. Imagine just your name's first syllable in the sugared well of his throat. Dream of all the ways he is not walking past you again, turning his eyes to the place where you are, where you're standing, where you shake, where you pray, where you aren't. Thirteen. You're almost fourteen. And you think you're ready to push beyond the brutal wisdoms of the one and the three, but some nagging craving you doesn't want to let go. You suspect that you will never be this unfinished, all hail Mary in precipice, stuttering sachet, fuses in your swollen chest suddenly lit and spinning, and you'll need to give your hips a name for what they did while you weren't there. You'll miss the pervasive fever that signals blooming, the sore lessons of jump rope in your calves. This is the last year your father is allowed to touch you. Sign, you push Barbie's perfect body through the thick dust of a top shelf. There, her prideful heart thunders. She has heartened you well. She has taught you everything.